The 20th century dawned to the roar of the internal combustion engine. Across Europe, engineers and designers were harnessing the power of this developing technology with new machines, competing against each other to see whose were the fastest. Their hunger for speed caught the public imagination and gave birth to an exciting new sport. Motor racing. Pioneering names like Aston Martin, Bentley, Alfa Romeo, Mercedes and more thrilled thousands as huge crowds gathered to watch their epic road battles. What happened here in Northern Ireland became part of motor racing's foundation story. For almost a decade, these were the roads where the fastest machines in the world and the men who drove them fought for supremacy in the race they all wanted to win until tragedy changed everything. This is the carriageway between Dundonald and Newton Arch. It's a really boring commute for loads of people every day. I did it myself for decades. One day, as I was stuck in a traffic jam up here, I spied on the left-hand side of the road a plaque marking the location of the starting grid for the Ards TT race. I knew nothing about this, and I still don't know very much. And I've seen the odd photograph, I've heard the odd story, and there's a wee bit of footage from back in those days. And what it tells me is that this was one of the most famous, glamorous, and prestigious motor races in the world. And here's the plaque, Tourist Trophy Races, Arch Circuit, 1928 to 1936. It is amazing to think that here there was a huge grandstand, the whole way around the course, up to about half a million people who flocked here to see this take place. The greatest motorsport brands in the world coming to the Arge circuit. This was an international sports car race with, for many, many years, this great and good from across Europe coming to race on open roads in front of perhaps half a million people. I think by 1927, 1928, Northern Ireland needed some good news. Everybody that was building a sports car, Aston Martin knew they had to be there. The Arch TT attracted the very best cars on the international circuit. But what does it feel like to drive one of these elite machines? Who better to ask than John Watson, five times Grand Prix champion with a very personal connection to this race. I had a dream. And that dream was I wanted to be a Formula One driver. You know, it's a funny thing when you, when you get to the level of, of motorsport that I achieved and you think back to where you came from. John Watson from Northern Ireland will be making his bid to bring the World Drivers' Championship back to Britain. My introduction to motor racing came very simply through my family. You think back to the time my, my father was growing up and in the 30s, I mean, we're talking about the, the Ards TT. He would have gone to that race. He would have been maybe an early teenager or a mid-teenager. So my father was one of those that started a race and it became a family affair. So my father would drive on the Saturday and my mother would go down and my sister and I would be there as part of the, the family. And uh, that was my introduction. I wish I was been around in 1928. The roots of the story lie years earlier, at the end of the 19th century, when a flurry of innovation brought new technology, new machines, and the prospect of a new century of speed. Certainly the 20th century, from the very first years, was all set to be the era of the internal combustion engine. I think it's like anything. You get a newfangled device. Initially, it was just a, a new, different way of getting from A to B. And people, but then immediately, man's competitive nature took over. 
and they, they, a few people thought, well, it'd be a bit more fun if I go quicker. Going faster is just what car designers wanted to do. But these machines could be dangerous, and eight road deaths across Europe led the British government to introduce an Act of Parliament in 1903. No horseless carriage was allowed to travel faster than 20 miles per hour. To race these new machines, you had to leave Britain. American newspaper millionaire and road racing fanatic Gordon Bennett found a way to swerve around the 20 mile an hour speed limit in England. In 1903, he convinced local councils in Ireland, which back then was still part of the British Empire, to allow road racing on Irish roads. Drivers in their swanky new cars competed on this island for the coveted Gordon Bennett Trophy. That's indeed where the birth of British Racing Green is allegedly comes from. The cars were painted dark green in honour of Ireland hosting the, that event. It fell to a group of far-sighted industrialists and motor car enthusiasts to come up with a plan to circumvent the 20 miles per hour limit and get the cars racing. This is the Royal Automobile Club in Pall Mall in London, the home and cathedral of British motoring. A place where races have been planned, where Grand Prix have been celebrated and where some of the most precious trophies in motorsport are still held to this day. This club was founded by a lot of early pioneers of the motor industry. They needed to convert a slightly sceptical population that the car was a thing of the future. The RAC came up with the idea of a TT, a tourist trophy. It's our most important trophy in the, in the trophy cabinets. It, it, it's the oldest continuously competed for motorsports trophy in the world. The reason it was called the Tourist Trophy was to attract tourists to come and watch the great spectacle. So in September 1905, they held the first Tourist Trophy. The race was not necessarily about absolute speed, but it was about proving the most reliable and the fastest touring car. It was a real race for people to win because with no other serious competition, how did you demonstrate that your car was the best car on the road? This tourist trophy, the very first TT, was held in the Isle of Man in 1905. It was another milestone in motor racing history and it caught the attention of an Ulster man and an Ulster Scot, visionary engineer and inventor Harry Ferguson and it planted a seed that would bear fruit in the new state of Northern Ireland 23 years later. But in the years that followed, there was little time for motorsport as the world was plunged into war. The TT race was suspended and many drivers joined up and fought on the Western Front. But for the young men who lived through the carnage of trench warfare in France, the world could never be the same. We're only just after the First World War, which in terms of brutality and loss of life uh, has never been exceeded. Uh, and I, th I do believe a lot of these young men, they suffered from what we call PTSD now. They were shell-shocked beyond belief and they came out, they lived every you know, four years on the edge and they needed to find the new adrenaline buzz. And for them that was motorsport. And so they, it, it, speed was the king. The faster you went, the bigger the buzz. These were all brave men and a lot of whom did it at the time for king and country, really, and, and Britain's prestige. In the aftermath of the war, the world was changed utterly. And on the island of Ireland, after years of conflict and political uncertainty, the new state of Northern Ireland emerged in 1921. This is Union Theological College in Belfast. And the inscription above the door is why we're here, because this is where the Parliament of Northern Ireland was held from 1921 to 1932. Northern Ireland's first Prime Minister was the Ulster Scot, Sir James Craig, and he faced huge challenges in the years that followed the establishment of the new state. I think by 1927, 1928, Northern Ireland needed some good news. There were key industrialists and other businessmen who had an interest in seeing Northern Ireland not just survive, but thrive economically. And I, I suppose even reputationally, it was important for them to prove that Northern Ireland could work. This is an effort to put a good face on Northern Ireland to the outside world. 
Sir James Craig, a canny businessman, saw the value in tourism and high-profile events that could attract visitors and much-needed investment. Harry Ferguson seized the moment, convincing Craig to pass the Road Races Act in 1922, allowing racing on the public roads. With the support of the Prime Minister, could he bring the greatest road race in the world to Ulster? To me, uh, Harry Ferguson was an entrepreneur, he was a visionary, he was a great designer, he was a great engineer. He saw the value, that uh, the way to promote quality engineering was to demonstrate it against it in a really hard style, and that was motor racing. So you needed to have the competition to be able to say that you'd beaten everybody else. Otherwise it was all chat and no action. From the very early years, when he had the dealership for Vauxhall, and given how uh, progressive he was in terms of tuning vehicles and racing vehicles, um, he was invited by the Vauxhall team to drive in the Grand Prix in France. So from very early on, uh, he, was, he was interested in car racing. One of Harry Ferguson's closest allies was William Wallace McLeod, a senior lecturer in motor engineering at the Belfast Institute of Technology. He also was the motoring correspondent for the Belfast Newsletter, and he proved a very willing ally with Harry Ferguson in the quest to start motor racing properly in Northern Ireland. But they put their heads together, and they visited Brooklands racing circuit in Surrey in England. Brooklands was an oval track, essentially, um, a proving ground at a racing track, and it was clear to everyone we spoke to that they would rather be racing on the continent on proper roads which wasn't feasible, wasn't, wasn't possible at all in Great Britain at that time. The likes of Campbell, Howe, K. Don, they were all racing at Brooklands, but it must have got a little bit boring going to the same track you know, every weekend and going round and round, and as we know from some of the period footage, occasionally they flew off the banking. They were all looking for new places to ch test themselves and challenge themselves, and Northern Ireland certainly would have had an appeal. McLeod writes an article for the newsletter was published on the 1st of November 1927, saying that they have been there, they have spoken to everybody, and everybody wants to come and race in Northern Ireland, and let's make this happen. Harry Ferguson in the Belfast newsletter, the correspondence to McLeod's original article, made it very clear that he wanted a great race. He wasn't interested in provincial racing, that if we were going to do this, it was going to be the biggest race in the world. Go big or go home. Go big or go home. Even though the idea had been conceived in Belfast, there was a lot of industry support, public support and government support. Harry Ferguson would have known that the RAC is where the final decision would be made. He spoke to the appropriate people in the RAC in London and promised them the earth. A team comes over to see two proposed circuits, the vision being that one hopefully someday will hold the British Grand Prix and another will hold the revived RAC Tourist Trophy as a sports car race in Northern Ireland. There well, quite a lot of members that I think would have been quite vociferous in both letter writing and badgering the, the committee to say, make this happen. Armed with their new road closing orders, Ferguson, MacLeod and a delegation from the RAC chose this 13 mile route in North Down, all the way down here past Bradshaw's Bray into the streets of Newtonard Town Centre. Just look at that bend, it is a great road and they came down there like absolute rocket ships. They love this circuit for many different reasons. It's a great motor racing circuit with good roads. Also, they're really close to Belfast, they've got great infrastructure, they've got trains and trams, they've got the ports at hand and they've got the yachts in Bangor. It's the perfect place to make their first international motor race in Northern Ireland. Journalist Rick Farragher grew up in the Isle of Man and is taking me to find out a bit more about the circuit Ferguson and MacLeod proposed. We have come to meet Simon Thomas, who has spent a lifetime researching the race. Original odds TT course. Simon, it's fast, thrilling, furious. And can you take us round a, a lap? You know, the course is over 13 miles. Initially, it was over 30 laps, six hours plus. Once they turned left onto Bradshaw's Bray, a really good wide road, well surfaced, a degree of camber to either side of the road. Fast road, 
probably flat out really, up to the first left hand uh, bend there, which was at the watering trough. Fast stretch down, down into Newton Arts, under the old railway bridge. Heavy braking zone turning right, swinging through Conway Square, and then down South Street. Still really flat out for most of the cars. Then swinging down into Cumber, Cumber Square and turning right at the butcher shop. The uh, final blast down to the Elk Inn or the Central Bar, as it was called. Ferguson and McLeod had identified the perfect route, but they needed a carefully orchestrated plan to bring the race to Ulster. Ferguson, he no doubt had the ear of people in the Northern Ireland government, but he also had to sell that to them to some extent because the RAC were never going to ask for the race. They had to be invited by the Northern Ireland government. So our friends were the wheels in between that made that happen. Now, this is exciting. This is the archive of government papers from 1927, 1928. This was in the aftermath of the Great War and the memories and experiences of that still very vivid, including a quotation by a Colonel Wilfred Spender. He was from England, but he famously wrote after the Battle of the Somme that I am not an Ulster man, but that day I wished I was an Ulster man more than anything else in the world. He got a job with the Northern Ireland government and it was Spender who signed off on the Road Races Act. That was the legislation which meant that motor racing could take place on public roads in the new Northern Ireland, a unique piece of legislation on these islands. William Wallace MacLeod's famous letter appeared in the newsletter on the 1st of November, 1927. And Harry Ferguson's response to that appeared the day after, so it was probably pre-prepared and the two of them were working very carefully together. Shortly after that, enter James Craig, the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. He wrote this. The Right Honourable Viscount Craig Avon, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, states that he is delighted to see that the first official meeting of the subcommittee convening the question of holding a Grand Prix motor car race in Ulster next year, that it took place and it will be found possible for it to take place. Very quickly, there's a reply from the RAC to Craig in which it says, I trust it will be possible for you all to arrange for a Grand Prix motor car race to take place in Northern Ireland next year. And you may rest assured that the government will do everything they can to facilitate matters. So not only do you have Ferguson and McLeod bringing their genius to bear, but the RAC and the government of Northern Ireland are there as well. I think from the club's point of view in 1928, the key bit was the enthusiasm but, but the Northern Irish government to actually close the roads. That, was, you know, that, that made everything possible. And I suspect that uh, in those days, everybody was leaned on to, on the basis, it was good for the, uh, for the nation, for the province. You know, people, I think people needed good news stories then, didn't they? We're only 10 years off the, uh, the brutal First World War. We're about to head into a recession. To suddenly have a world-class event on your doorstep it was a really good thing, and as I say, it put Northern Ireland on the map, I believe. Ferguson and MacLeod had pulled it off, and the world's most prestigious road race was coming to Ulster. And this is it, the tourist trophy. It's absolutely beautiful. And around the base, inscribed in these silver panels, Ard Circuit Ulster. 1928 onwards on one side and the 1930s on the other side. I mean, this is a legendary piece of silverware. It's one of the earliest, maybe the earliest trophy in motorsport. And it normally lives in this enormous glittering trophy cabinet just behind us, right beside the one which says Lewis Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton. In its era, the drivers who participated in Ards were of Hamilton's calibre. The finest, the fastest, the most glamorous, and they flocked to Ards and Cumber and Dundonald to compete for this.
It, it would be akin to a Grand Prix arriving on the shores of Ulster today. But the great and the good arrive, uh, including uh, Thistlethwaite, who parks his yacht in Bangor Marina with the Mercedes-Benz on it and comes to race. The, obviously, the, the competition cars arrived in Belfast and it had to be winched off the boats. This was an international sports car race on open roads in front of perhaps half a million people who had come from across these islands and follow afield to see this spectacle. A few years before the idea of a race emerged, the Ulster Tourist Development Association was founded in 1925. And its job was to attract people from all over the world to come to this new state of Northern Ireland. And of course it was the 1928 edition where they realised that this race was a new draw to bring people here. And when you turn to the advert on the right hand page here, there it is, Ulster's International Motor Car Race, 18th of August, 1928. Motor racing was big time. Everybody that was building a sports car knew they had to be there. You had Karat Schoeler, then you had New Valari, Freddie Dixon. They really didn't know fear, those chaps. It was all about the winning, the daring do. And to see them came spectators, thousands of them. Every bank, every hedgerow is rammed with people. On the 18th of August, 1928, 44 international drivers took to the starting grid right here in their Mercedes, Aston Martins and Bentleys. As the flag fell, they thundered off under the gracious patronage of the Governor of Northern Ireland. One of the great scenes of, of the first race, a great a tragic scene in its way, uh, was Malcolm Campbell's Bugatti catching fire at the end of the second lap in the pits and burning out completely as a total loss. After a gruelling 30 laps and six hours in the driver's seat, Kay Don, an Englishman born in Ireland, took the chequered flag driving a supercharged Lee Francis. The Ard TT had its first champion. But the whole thing was a terrific success. And a week later, the RAC wrote to Craig. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, it is understood that the government of Northern Ireland would be disposed to give favourable consideration to a proposal by the RAC to hold another race in 1929 in Ulster. Motor racing in Ulster was up and running. Since those early days of motoring and the early people coming to visit Ireland and race in Ireland, there has been something in the air and it's just, it's just in the soil here that we love a race. In Simon Thomas's garage in the heart of County Down, Rick has discovered a treasure trove. Vintage cars collected and lovingly restored, each one a veteran competitor in the Ards TT. Wow, Simon, beautiful, what a car. How long have you had this car and how do you... 12 years. By the late 20s, the TT had become an international motor race. But it only completed six laps in the race and retired with electrical problems. And initially, my father was a marshal at the 1935 and 1936 TTs with my godfather. My mother, after the war, was a timekeeper at the TT with her association with you know, the, the official side of the race timekeeping. I was interested in that and my father raced a rally just after the war at Ards Airfield. I was very fortunate through friends of my, my parents who were interested in motor racing and things that uh, they passed on a lot of their possessions to me. Others I have bought at auction, I have bartered, I have swapped, uh, a bit like dinky toys in the playground, I suppose. Basically, it has all been done around sourcing the history of, of the three TT cars. The rest has, has been peripheral, but uh, uh, just to be able to know where a car raced before it came to Ards or after Ards or what country it went to or who owned it, and their background has always been important to me. The track was fast and treacherous. Uh, here is Paul on his bench. K Dawn, the original Ards TT winner, had a lucky escape. I just get it, turn it round and turn it over. I was stuck underneath the car. And if I had strapped myself in the car, they wouldn't have been able to pull me out. There are drivers who are driving a race car 
And then there are racing drivers. I like to think I was a racing driver. And the element of being a racing driver is you want to beat your competitor. If you look at the quality of the field, both in drivers and in cars, uh, Every big name was there. It was the ABC. I can start with the first two, Alfa Romeo and Bentley. <laughs> Think of the logistics for Alfa Romeo to wake up in Varese and say, right, we're going all the way to Northern Ireland because that's the most important race to win in the world. You know, the manufacturers realised with the coverage the race got that you know, the, the saying was, you uh, race and win on Saturday, sell on Monday. British manufacturers bringing in the best of continental talent to drive their cars. Um, so you, every, every box was really ticked. Uh, what an amazing roll call of winners. You know, you, New Valari, one of the greatest, greatest drivers that ever raced. He won twice you know, in a one, two, three for Alfa Romeo. Imagine someone like Tazio Nuvolari, the commandatory, outright racers, people that grabbed the car by the scruff of the neck and ragged that car to the limit of the car, to the limit of the racetrack, sometimes beyond the limit of the racetrack, entertaining a public who would have been enthralled to see a driver of that skill and magnitude driving around Quarry Corner, going up towards Bradshaw's Bray, down into Newton Ards, then the straight between Newton Ards and Cumber, then that tricky section past Valley Stockard, back to Dundonald to the Herpen. When I got onto a racing car, it's a very physical experience. The car is, while it's a metal box or a, maybe like this, a cigar tube or a modern contemporary Formula One car. But you get a feeling and a message coming through, whether it's the vibrations or just the, the physical senses that your body's picking up. And because of, of the, the level of adrenaline your body generates, once you step inside a race car, every single sense in your body is heightened to a level which is almost, I can imagine, like a, like a drug. The physical aspect of it is just sensational. Honestly, can't express it enough. Haven't had it for a long time. I don't want to go back and revisit it because I know what would happen. I'll be back at it again. Fifth of September, 1936, dawned rainy and cold. There were already safety concerns over the race due to the number of spectators and also the steadily rising speeds. Constable Freddie Dixon can repeat his last year's victory. For Freddie is the man who takes bigger risks than anyone and seems to get away with it. Health and safety. I don't even know if it was even those two words existed. Technology of the day and the safety issues and concerns, both for competitor, but maybe more importantly for spectators. They were racing in light cotton overalls with maybe a cotton flying helmet, uh, no safety gear. But the, the style of a race at that time was a different style to where we are today because you're driving then on public roads. You think to the lap times they were achieving back then, just under 80 miles an hour, average speed for a 13 and a half mile racetrack. Even in today's terms, if you could take a, a, a quick road car and lap at, at nearly 80 miles an hour average speed. Easy, but this is going back 80, 90 years. This year, there are 33 starters for the fastest road race in the British Isles, the RAC Tourist Trophy. By 1936, the Arch TT had become a famous fixture on the international circuit. To all intents and purposes, it was a huge success. A vindication of the vision and passion of the men who'd worked so hard to bring it to Northern Ireland. This year's tourist trophy will be remembered above all for one of the most terrible accidents in the history of international motor racing. A Riley driven by Jay Chambers of Belfast gets into a skid as it passes through Newton Arts. So Mark, this was the fastest stretch of this course. And we stood here now, you can picture the cars flying off Bradshaw's Bray into the town here in Newton Arts. And once they hit this point here, pretty much right where we're standing, they're going at lightning speed. 
But the very idea of just families out for a nice afternoon to watch the race go by and suddenly carnage. Hits a lamppost, cutting it in two and then charges the crowd. As we go to print, we learn that six people are dead and some ten others in a serious condition. The driver of the car is unhurt. Most people thought if a car goes out of control, the spectators will run out of the way and be safe by the time the car gets to the, wherever they might be standing. It wasn't until the Monday morning when the newspapers were published that the full extent of the tragedy was revealed. Eight people were dead and over 40 injured. Standing here today, it's hard to believe that this is the scene of Northern Ireland's worst racing car disaster. This is the garden of Charlie Fulton. Who lives A rare interview from one of the last surviving eyewitnesses to the tragedy was captured by local filmmakers Noel and Roy Spence in the 1990s. You actually saw the accident. The particular accident that you're talking about happened uh, over on the other side of the street there. Yes. The uh, round, round camber on the road used to take the cars away over to the other side. Right. And then they had a job getting back. Right. What really helped us out and which made our film, the documentary made special, was the fact that we got hold of from a friend, original footage shot in 16mm in pristine condition, never before seen with the public. That sequence we managed to get, the, 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 the commentary says there was a camera in the road which dragged his, the car over and we were able to get, actually get shots taken from ground level but shows the railway, old railway bridge in the, in the background and shows the camber in the road which caused the accident. So He just hopped across the road to the far side mm -hmm. and uh, then there was two, two young boys killed then. Mm -hmm. I can't remember their name, but uh, the two young boys was, uh, they weren't killed by the car, they, they were hit by the lamppost that the car had right. and broke. And the uh, place was very quiet, that was uh, the strange thing about it, mm -hmm. it uh, they were quiet, Every, everybody was quiet. And shocked, I suppose. And shocked. And I thought it was quite poignant when he told about the silence after the accident. He said there was no fuss, it was just a, a hushed uh, silence. A dreadful thing. Again, my father and my godfather were young marshals just up the road. And they didn't know about the accident because the accident happened just beside the hospital. And the race continued. And uh, it was absolutely shocking. And to my mind, really coloured my thoughts on, on the TT. The tourist trophy never returned to Ards again. This is the grave of Samuel Wilson. Called home 5th of September 1936, aged 14 aged years. 14. And for all the international glamour and attention, this is the local tragedy that the family and neighbours were left with. Samuel, just one of the eight victims that day, and some of the others are buried in the cemetery. And it really hits home just how much of a tragedy this was. Maybe like the inscription, it's a bit faded and maybe almost forgotten today. Sam was very young. There aren't many families left today who have a connection back to the Arch TT, but we have found two of his relatives, Valerie and Jenny, who have invited me to their home tonight, where I hope we can find out more. Samuel was my uncle, but unfortunately I didn't get to meet him after getting killed in the CT races, so it was horrific really. And I always remember seeing the photograph, well, in um, Mum's mum's house, and I always remember seeing it and thinking, 
oh my goodness and we always used to talk about it and then obviously the graveyard's only around the corner and we'd always go up and we'd always try to find the grave didn't we yeah i just always remember growing up and talking about it so the newspaper accounts say that samuel and his friend william had been killed together yes at the same moment and then the the funerals that began on the tuesday afterwards and um, they were the first of the five arch people to be buried that afternoon and then even in the cortege walking a bit along behind was the father of the driver, um, Alderman Chambers, oh. which is an amazingly gracious thing for the people of Ards and for your families mm -hmm. yeah. to accept it was. him to participate in the grief of the town is just incredible. His sister's still alive and she would be 87, is, is about 87? 87, 87 she is. Yes. So she'd be mum's aunt, she's my great aunt. And I always remember as a child, and even now, like we would always talk about him and hear stories that Aunt Isabel would have told us about him. And obviously mum passes all the stories down to me, so it's lovely to hear. And then obviously where he was killed, and sometimes we would talk to him, even though people would probably think I'm crazy. <laughs> I love this photograph, because I really think I can see I the do. resemblance of Sammy. I think Sammy really looks like mum in that photograph. You know, like her nose. I was coming out of one of my friend's houses actually, and this gentleman stopped to talk to me and I think he wanted to share the story with me that he had been Samuel's friend when he was a young boy and he was about 80 at this stage you know so um, he said he was standing watching the race and having a really good time and he said I have to go and do a message for my mum and so he didn't come back again and he didn't lose his life that day so he was just one of those lucky. he was lucky Just had a really moving evening here with Valerie and Jenny at the family home in Newton Arts, I'm talking with them about Samuel and of how the tragedy of his death has affected the family right down through the generations. And this story is about things like Bugattis and Mercedes and all of the glamour and speed that came here in those in those years. But it's really tonight, it's when you meet a family who still today, almost a hundred years later, are living with it that it really brings it home. If you had been in the committee of the RAC at the time, you probably would, or I would have made probably the similar decision. It's a very difficult thing to ignore death. You know, the legacy is still there for people in Newton Arch who lost loved ones, really. The vision and ambition of Ferguson and McLeod meant that for those few years, the eyes of the world were on this corner of Ulster, my home place. Cumber is a town I've known my whole life. The cars came out of Newton Arge, charged into Cumber Square, hurtled round Butcher's Shop Corner and on to Dundonald. The high octane intensity of those days, I mean, you can just picture it when you stand here. But the memories of those days are, are bittersweet. But when I think of young Samuel, and those other lost lives, I wonder, was the incredible success really worth the terrible price that was paid?